Welcome to Utah State University's Vertebrate Paleontology course. My name is Benjamin Berger, and in this video, we will examine the mystery of bat origins and think of ways in which we can further investigate the origin of bats. Molecular phylogenies of living mammals group mammals other than monotremes, marsupials, xenarthrins, and alphatherians into a monophyletic group called the uh, Borea eutheria, which is split into two large clades, the Laurasia theria and the U. arcantaglieris. There is still some debate as to what belongs into each of these groups, but recent advances in molecular research have settled on a group that contains the rodents, rabbits, tree shrews, colugas, and primates into U. arcantaglieris, while the rest of placental mammals are tossed into the Laurasia theria. Since these groups contain so many lineages of mammals, there are very few, if any, morphological traits that unite these large clades. Members of both of these large clades appear at the base of the Paleocene, but these forms are archaic and most traits of modern mammalian orders evolved near the base of the Eocene, about 10 million years after the extinction of the dinosaurs. One such group to appear first in the Eocene are the bats. The origin and evolution of bats during the early Cenozoic is a major mystery in paleontology, and many researchers have been hoping to recover fossils that would illustrate the transition from a terrestrial shrew-like little mammal to the only flying mammals, the bats. Living bats are grouped into two groups, the microcoroptera, which are the small bats, and the larger megacoroptera. Megacoropterans feed on fruits and have larger snouts, and they don't rely as heavily on echolocation, which allowed microcoropterans to navigate in the dark. For many years, the close similarity between megacoroptera and lemurs suggested a close affinity between bats, particularly megacoropterans, and primates. Recent studies, however, have confirmed the monophyletic grouping of all bats, both mega and microcoropterans, and a more distant relationship with primates. In fact, bats are placed within the Laurasia theria and are more closely related to shrews and moles. The fossil record of bats is one of the poorest for mammals, with only about 88% of bats that uh, existed leaving a fossil record. They also are one of the most successful orders of mammals, with the second most number of species in the group, falling behind the rodents. The oldest fossil bats are known from the Middle Eocene about 48 million years ago. The well-preserved Ichernicterus from the Green River Formation of Wyoming shows that a well-developed wing had already risen by this time. The wings of bats are supported by a patigium that spreads out from the five digits of the hand. And this is unlike pterosaurs, which retained uh, some of the function of um, gripping for the first three digits. The thumb is the only digit in bats that can grip, which means that bats uh, need to use their thumbs for scrambling around, as well as their feet, which are, are tied in with their patigium by what is called the calcare, a membranous um, patigium between the foot and the tail. Now, bats would be unable to compete with birds um, when it comes to flying, as uh, they are moderately good at active flight, but they lack the really strong flight muscles that birds have. 
So bats have evolved the ability to fly at night in the pitch dark. And this is a niche that has allowed them to be very successful throughout the Cenozoic uh, alongside birds. The evolution of echolocation that allows this nocturnal activity pattern, we know a little bit more uh, about from the fossil record. The discovery of the Middle Eocene bat on Nyctoris in 2003 and its subsequent study gave um, new insight into the origin of echolocation. The skull was brilliantly preserved, including the basocranium. You can see this strange long thin bone lying across the ear region. And this is the stylohyoid process, and it has a unique function in bats. In humans and other mammals, the stylohyoid process of the temporal bone is an attachment site for a muscle that runs between the skull and the hyoid bone in the throat, which elevates the hyoid and helps in swallowing. However, in bats, this slender bone um, process becomes involved in echolocation. Echolocation requires a connection between the vocal production of a sound and the reception of that sound as accurately as possible. When a bat is flying around in the pitch dark, a high pitch sound is made in the throat and the sound wave travels out and bounces off the surrounding objects and then returns that reflected wave of sound that's then received by the middle ear. Having a connection between the sound producing structure and the sound receiving structure allows the ear to detect the distance the return sound traveled at. And this is because there is both the near instantaneous initial signal and the reflected sound and then both are detected by the tympanic membrane. Having a connection between the sound producing structure and the sound receiving structure allows the ear to detect the distance the returning sound traveled at. And this is because there is both the near instantaneous initial signal and the reflected sound and both are detected by the tympanic membrane. The length of time between the initial signal from the throat and the signal from the reflected sound wave off the objects around indicates how far away the object is in the dark. Having a bony connection between the sound producing structure and the throat and the sound receiving structure, the tympanic membrane, is what this little bony process is all about. The fossil Onconictris, the stylohyoid process, is a thin sliver of a bone, but it's not as well connected with the opening of the tympanic membrane. In modern bats, the process is integrated within the tympanic bone via a bifurcation or paddle-like tip. Sensitivity to sound also requires bats to have an enlarged cochlea in the inner ear, as well as a larger um, orbital um, aponosis of the malleus bone, which allows for this tiny muscle to attach to the malleolus, and this helps dampen loud um, sounds. Hence, Onconictris shows a bat that was transitional in the way it was using echolocation. Onconictris and Icaronictris are not the only bats known from the Middle Eocene. Several fossil bats are known from Messel in Germany, a fossil locality about the same age as the Green River Formation bats in North America. European forms include Hysonictris, um, Paleocoropteryx, and Archaeonictris. Hence, by the, by the Middle Eocene, bats were widespread geographically, and if we're interested in finding older fossils, 
we need to look into the Paleocene. Now the problem is, is that we don't have good shales in the Paleocene epoch, and most of the record of mammals is only known from fossilized teeth. So we need to look at the teeth of bats and how we can recognize them from other mammals. And this is pretty darn tricky. Most bat molars feature a W-shaped upper molar with high shearing teeth that's useful for a diet of insects. And this is called dilambda dented uh, teeth. However, in bats that feed on fruit, the upper molars are more bunidont and look similar to fruit-eating primates. This paleontologist could actually find the fossil uh, teeth of bats in the Paleocene and misrecognize them as either primates or another insectivore. So if you're interested in finding the next earliest bat in the fossil record, you're gonna hope for a nice, complete skeleton, which would include the delicate finger bones that would have made up the early wing. And we've not yet found one of these yet. Now, many people have speculated about what a protobat would look like and how it would have evolved from a shrew-like ancestor. I guess we need to just keep looking in the fossil record. All right, you should be able to devise a program of study to investigate the origin of bats by looking for the fossil record in the Paleocene and targeting rock formations that have the same style of preservation as the Green River Formation and the Messel Fossil Site in Germany. In the next lecture, we will examine the evolution of shrews and other insectivores. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about Utah State University's geology program, check out the website geology.usu.edu or my own website at benjamin burgerorg Links are found in the description below.